So I think that's about it for now. I think we can go ahead and start the presentation. I have a lot of slides. Some of them are teeny little videos also. And I hope everything works. The internet just popped up and told me it was a little unstable. So hopefully things will go. So this is one of the pictures. This beginning picture is um, one of the ones that I took the very first night I landed in Zanzibar. And that was March 3rd. Um, 2020, I flew in from Arusha after being all through the Serengeti uh, to Zanzibar City and then carried on to Blue Bay Beach Resort in, Co uh, <laughs> I knew I was gonna mix this up, Cahuenga. Um, it is approximately 46 minute drive from the West Shore to the East Shore. This is just a quick pick from the airplane. You can see in the way background there, kind of behind the clouds, um, that's the Indian Ocean. This I'll let you read. Um, it, the, it's an archipelago, Zanzibar. I, before I went there, I thought it was all one island, but it's many, many islands. Um, I was on the Pemba Island. It was famous. Um, for being the perfect spot for the trade routes between the mainland and the Middle East. The main items of trade were slaves and spices now, hopefully, okay, thankfully that's gone, but the spices are definitely still there. Home to about a million, mostly living in the lowlands um, in the West and the Northwest, there are ridges of coralline rock and it's quite a different rock, but some of it looks a little bit similar to us lots of fossils and stuff in there. But coming from the Serengeti, I was shocked when I got off the plane because it was 100% humidity um, doing because of the over 60 inches of rain annually and the temperatures were so high, I was instantly sweating, just standing there breathing. Um, certainly no animals to be seen, um, mongoose, monkeys, duper and civet cats, um, but was delighted to see a hundred bird species um, were, was able to be seen. There is um, Zanzibar leopard, but it was varying conflicting information about that, whether it's actually extinct or not. So I wasn't expecting to see that. Um, no plains either. I was coming from plains and mountains. And then here it was just fairly flat from what I could see and acres of coconut and banana and citrus crops. This is a, a little picture that I had just to show you where things are. Um, the mainland is obviously that big piece of land there. Madagascar is that huge island and where Zanzibar is, is just those tiny little islands that are very, very close to the edge of Tanzania, just about where that picture of the woman is. Um, that's where Zanzibar is and um, black pepper, ginger, cinnamon, and nutmeg. The economy is certainly based on natural resources and farming and is also very vulnerable to variables such as unpredictable weather, which can cause the economy to surge up and down. And it's very vulnerable to global warming. This is um, just a little map of the island. Um, I landed here in Zanzibar, if you can see my cursor. We traveled along here up a major highway, um, up about to here and then across to Kawenga. And that's where my resort was. And I have a little story to tell you about that, that's for sure. Um, when I was landing in the plane, the plane was an hour late. I was supposed to be being picked up by a company to take me to my resort, um, but I couldn't see them anywhere. I couldn't see my name anywhere. So I was just kind of standing there looking around. A porter came up to me, very friendly, very sweet, took my baggage, was starting to trundle me through the airport into the outside. And he said, oh, we'll, we'll find you your person out here. And um, so me, being there by myself, I trusted him. And he took me outside. Um, there were many vehicles 
standing there and drivers to take people to their various destinations. Um, anyways, I he called out the name of my resort uh, many times, no takers at all. So he said, oh, well, come over here. And he kind of took me over to a little restaurant, shuffled me in there with all my baggage and everything and um, left me there. And I never saw him again. So that was a little alarming. I sat there for a while. Um, I tried calling the Blue Bay Resort, but my phone wouldn't work um, in that area. I went up to the officials of the airport. They were very unhelpful. Um, and when I did get someone to say that, yes, I could use their phone, it was only if I would give them $10 US up to $20 US to call the hotel. So now I'm two hours after the time of pickup and uh, a cabbie came over beautifully dressed, a very genteel man and um, said that he would certainly offer to take me to my hotel and it would take at least an hour and a half. And um, I didn't know at the time, but it actually was only 46 minutes, but it did take us an hour and a half and uh, that I would have to pay him about $50 uh, American. So you can read this slide. The currency in Tanzania is in shilling. And um, I had to stop because I had very little money with me. I only had a little bit of American money. So I had to stop at a money machine. So the denominations are come in 10,000 shillings per bill. They're very bright red bills. They look like Canadian bills actually because of the color. But you have to be very aware going to the bank machine because when you ask for $120 in US to be exchanged into Tanzanian bills, you end up with such a huge amount of bills. There's no possible way you could fit them in a wallet. It was ridiculous. The money just kept flying out of the machine. A US dollar is 2,310 shillings. So you can imagine in 10,000 bill per shilling, that means you end up with 28 bills. So <laughs> it was quite a stack bill coming out. So how do you be very discreet bringing that out of a, a building? Uh, like I said, the island is 85 kilometers long and I was taxied from the airport uh, on the Western side to the Eastern part of the island. It took an hour and a quarter, um, but that was my, I'm doing right there because I didn't realize that I was being scammed. That's what the biggest problem was. Apparently this scam goes on with the porters and the cabbies and it's for them to make money. But I was safe. I got there and I did pay for my own expense, but I got a hold of the company once I got there and um, they gave me everything back again. And because it was Worldwide Quest is who I had traveled with, um, I had talked to them, everything was taken care of immediately. I was so impressed with them, it was unreal. I didn't book very much when I went to Zanzibar because I wasn't sure what to expect. And I had really only booked a spice trip and a cooking trip. Um, but because of the mistake at the airport and me being scammed, uh, the company that Worldwide Quest had um, hired for me to be using while I was in Zanzibar were fantastic. I got many, many more things. I got my money returned to me right away. The gentleman that looked after me was fantastic. He called me every day. I was very, very well taken care of. Um, this is the lounge and the bar area in the building where I was. It was beautiful. Then the next day, I went on the spice trip. We were heading to a um, farm. Um, I was taken to a private farm, which was about half of all the spice farms are private. The other half of the spice farms are government farms. And they also grow not only spices and fruit, but cassava also, which is a, a staple food. That in the background there is all a new banana plantation. There was banana trees absolutely everywhere. Breadfruit. This, I imagine most of you can know. Um, the slide on the right uh, shows the tree because I wanted to try and show you how big the tree was. 
these are the little tiny blossoms that start out being that fruit. So if most of you know, it's a nutmeg. And with the mace covering, the red was the mace. And the nutmeg itself is underneath the shell where the red was. And, um, and everything smelled like nutmeg. There was no, no denying that's what it was. But the fleshy part of it almost looked like an apple. And then it, it pops itself open. Uh, actually, it's more like a peach. It pops itself open when it's ripe enough. And then the, the spice is exposed. This was just one of the little houses that was on the edge of the spice farm. And you can just see a small garden of maize there. This is jackfruit. Um, it's a very interesting fruit. And so many of the trees there, which surprised me, um, the fruit grows off the trunks of the trees. This is an unripe orange. And um, certainly they don't ever ripen to the color that we're quite used to. So a ripe and an unripe one. And they're very pale inside and very sweet and very juicy, far more juicy than the oranges that we get. This <laughs> was hilarious. We were walking along this very dirt trail. Uh, the the uh, soil was so dry, every time you put your sandal down, there was this big puff of like talcum powder, so my feet were absolutely filthy. Anyways, we get to this area where we're walking along and I can hear something squeaking and I looked to my right, and here's this man coming. You can see at the back of the cart that's just absolutely loaded with vegetation. And it was this oxen. And my guide very seriously said to me, this is the Zanzibar Ferrari. And I kind of looked at him and thought, OK, that's fine. <laughs> they actually do use tractors. But three quarters of it is done by oxen and cart. This astounded me. It was cloves. Um, this is the blossom. Um, the young fellow that was with us, I had a, a guide and a person that worked at the spice farm and a driver uh, that was all accompanying me. So each blossom is only one clove. That just blew me away. I couldn't believe that it was just one clove. So you think of all the cloves that we use and that's actually completely a blossom. The picture on the left shows cassava and or yucca, whichever you want to call it. Um, you eat the whole plant. The leaves are chopped and stewed with onions and it, they call it spinach. And it actually does taste like spinach. It tastes very good. It's not difficult to chew or anything. You'd think that maybe it was, it gets quite soft. And I'm sure you've seen some of the yucca in the grocery stores here now that it's that long tuberous and it's very white inside and the root is eaten either fresh or dried. They do all sorts of things with it. And it actually is tapioca. That's how we know it um, is tapioca, either minute or the pearls or starch. This is coffee. There was a great deal of coffee there. So you can see the small trees. There's a couple of the little berries up in there. And then this is what it looks like when it's in blossom. And that's, um, they showed me various handfuls of it. So that's all various ways of, of how the coffee is ripening. You can see it on the trees there too. This is a picture of a coffee tree, the trunk. And it was probably about, oh, maybe 20 inches or so in diameter. It was very large and very knobby. The trees don't get terribly big. They're about the size of maybe a small apple tree. Um, so I was interested to see how, how big these vines were and they do keep them in for quite a long time before they pull them up and restart. Vanilla, as you can see, vines. There was many, many vines of vanilla, but you can see the beans, they're ripening and it is an orchid, um, but then they ripen and become quite dark so that it's the vanilla pod like we know. And there was fowl everywhere. This is cinnamon. I did have a little video, but it was just Tim cutting the cinnamon off. It was actually a 
tourist tree that they used just to show examples of it. But the cinnamon, the smell of it was incredible. It was so perfumed, not like the cinnamon that we get at all. A lot of the cinnamon that we get is not cinnamon bark, it's cassia or cassa. And um, a lot of it doesn't come from Zanzibar, it comes from many other places. India is one of them. But this cinnamon is true cinnamon, it is the bark and they do cut it so that it rolls and that's when you see it in cinnamon sticks. This was a quote of one of the women that I had the privilege of meeting. Um, most people think like once people are poor, they're not desperate and they're not happy. But like most African countries, poor people in Tanzania are happy because the first thing which makes you happy is family. And once they're around family, they can cook and eat together and they're happy and forget their troubles. We are not as miserable as people think. So that, that really took me back. This <laughs> is, you can see all the different vegetables and things. These women were all sitting communally making food for the workers that were working on the spice farm. And as I'm watching them, I, I took this picture purposely because I wanted to see all the different ingredients. You can see all the limes and peppers, potatoes, eggplant, tomatoes, lots of tomatoes actually, a lot of onions, carrots, beans. This woman <laughs> was sitting peeling the carrots and stuff and I said to my guide, you know, I kind of chuckled and said, you know, peeling carrots is just the same anywhere. And then she turned very smartly to me after he said that to her and said, okay, then you come and help. So the majority of cooking is done in community, communal areas. Recipes are passed down, residing, result, <laughs> sorry, resulting in beautiful complex flavors and the traditions that you can taste. And then one of the ladies um, in a cookbook of mine, culture is not static, but it doesn't move very quickly. And like I said, I was lucky enough to have spent time cooking with these ladies for the people on the spice farms. And they eat very simple, but delectable and nutritious food. They're their um, opening cardamom. <clears throat> Chickens were everywhere. And I actually took a lot of these pictures because my son, one of my sons is a fly fisherman and I was trying to make him jealous of all the beautiful feathers that these cockerel had on them. And cows were all over the place. They don't drink very much milk. It's completely different culture than the Maasai um, that live on milk and blood and cattle are the, the biggest thing in their lives actually. But these cattle are revered because they do produce milk and meat, but they don't eat very much meat. Um, but they do use them for uh, milk and they, they wear wandering all through the spice farm. This young man walked all along with me. Um, he was a guide from the farm. He's actually showing me a lime uh, there. He was continually weaving the whole time that we were walking along um, with the leaves in the tour and he made me a purse to carry all my samples because everything that they showed me, they gave me a sample of. Um, he made a bracelet that was attached to a ring, a frog necklace and a crown, obviously, you know, me. <laughs> this was ginger, which I was kind of surprised. I wasn't sure what ginger would look like. Um, you can see all the little root things that come out from the bottom of it. And it does um, spread that way. And when they pulled a piece of the ginger up for me, I've tasted ginger a million times, I love it. But man, oh man, this ginger was so hot. I couldn't believe how hot it was coming straight out of the ground, but it was beautiful. This is uh, the lipstick plant. They were so giggly when they were showing me this. And uh, this young man actually put it on his lips and his lips were red for the rest of the day. And they also use this, um, it's very high uh, antiseptic. So they also use it on wounds. I'll just let you read that. And actually that picture was really cool because um, that's almost identical to my daughter's 
wallpaper in her room. This was one of the areas where the women were cooking. If it was raining, they would cook in there. And the star fruit, the, the, uh, you can see a little bit of the blossom in the background. I'm not a huge fan of star fruit, but this tasted beautiful. Now, I know this is a little bit hard to see, but if you really look on the left-hand side, you'll see the chain of berries. And this is actually pepper. And it grows in a vine. And you can see how lush the vines are, and they were everywhere. Um, when I was there, I did buy white pepper. Um, it's actually the green peppercorn that is dried, and it's very, very fragrant. It's quite hot um, when it's ground and much lighter in color. It's not as fruity as the black pepper that we know. But the black pepper is just um, ripe pepper that has been dried. There's different look there. And you can see how hot I was. Um, I don't know if you can see on your screen, but my legs were covered with all those sores and blisters like I talked about the last time because I found I was allergic to the medication for malaria. So that caused a bit of issue. You can see my frog necklace, my fabulous crown and my bracelet that's attached to a ring. I'll let you read this. This is kind of cool because you know the jingle about the stuck on Band-Aid because Band-Aid stuck on me. Well, that's exactly what it did. It was quite marvelous. And I'm sorry, I don't remember the name. Grapefruit, man, they were as big as your head. <laughs> and that love apple that's on the right hand side, they are beautiful, very, very brilliant red, um, very stark white inside. The texture is very much like an apple, but they don't taste like an apple at all. Um, they taste more like an Asian pear. Oh, this is a little video. Um, I hope it runs. Let's give it a try and see. But this is when I was sitting there with my crown on, this man decided he was going to give me a, a bit of a show. Okay. <laughs> Whenever you're ready. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Jambo. Jambo na wewe. Hakuna matata. No problem. Welcome down from Mr. Butterfly. Mr. Okay? Butterfly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, that was it was quite interesting I had a hard time figuring out what he was saying but he was saying welcome to Zanzibar that was one of the things and that um, Akuna Matata they do say a lot and Jambo is hello so this little picture shows you pineapple and there was a lot of fields of pineapple actually and papaya Now, this was getting towards the end of my time at the spice farm. They took me into this covered area, and this is all the spices that they've collected, dried, packaged, and are, um, are for sale. Um, this is chili, and man, oh, man, was it hot. 
This is the white pepper. If you can see my cursor, there's cardamom there, cinnamon, beautiful, beautiful pieces of cinnamon. Um, this is dried ginger and it's very, very dried. And I brought, certainly brought some of it home and it uh, is beautiful. Very hot and very spicy. I'll just let you read that. I did bring my, oh, my daughters-in-law and my granddaughter and that um, perfume home also. And uh, it was in very tiny little bottles, certainly nothing fashionable like what we have, but the mixes were gorgeous. And they do, this farm in particular, does uh, grow ylang ylang and that is what is in Chanel number no. five. So they called their own brand Chanel number no. nine. This is just a picture of a little restaurant. Um, the menu was on the outside. So you can see chai, um, supa, um, samaki, which is a, a fish that I don't know how to say that next one, but it's squid. And then chips, that kind of gave me a chuckle that chips was just in English. This was everywhere, plants like this, it was gorgeous. Now we're at the Blue Bay Resort. This is on the Northeast side of the island. This is me taking a picture from the beach. So all that that's covered under there, it went on forever on the left-hand side, that white area was a little gazebo where you could eat in there. Um, the rest of it was all open. All the front area was cool. It was absolutely gorgeous. And our buildings were all way behind. You had to walk um, on pathways that were beautiful and then got into your buildings from there. This is um, the tide coming up at night. The beaches that are there are all private beaches um, that I had taken the picture of just the previous screen. Um, no one is allowed up there but guests. And then oh, there's all these pylons that have been put on the beach. And then the beach that's below that is the public beach. But when the tide comes up every night, it leaves all these shells on top of the pylons. And then the frack line is what you're seeing on the right hand side. Yeah. <laughs> It was so hot there. So the picture on the left is me, obviously, in a bathing suit. But I left a lot of things. There's a lot of things that aren't in this picture anymore. My red hair isn't there anymore. My sunglasses, I lost them. And I'm 40 pounds lighter than what I was. <laughs> so that kind of gives you an idea of what I actually left there. <laughs> um, and then the Indian Ocean behind I was very surprised at how warm it was and um, over here I don't know if you can see my cursor but there's two men there these are Maasai um, fellas that come over from the mainland they work there they work sometimes for the companies and um, they accompany you back and forth uh, like they did in Africa, but certainly no animals or anything. But these guys are called beach boys and they patrol the beaches and pick up tourists, get them to go out into the dows or the catamaran type boats. Um, you are asked to pay at least $80 or so for a ride, but it's beautiful. They take you out to a reef, but it's a little bit of a scam too, because then when you get out to the reef, they ask you for $100 to bring you back to shore. So that's quite the thing. This was just inside my room. It was just beautiful. Every day was beautiful. As I had told you before, because of the kind of mess at the airport, now they were allowing me to have these tours of places. So if you can see a quick, uh, I don't know if you can see the pictures very much, but I was very fortunate because they allowed me to do pretty much anything I wanted with these tours and it was all for free. So I didn't have to pay for anything. So I did go to the village. I did see the Dows being built. Um, I did go to the Turtle Aquarium. 
And uh, I didn't bother doing <laughs> swimming and sunbathing there, but they did take me to a hotel and uh, served me lunch, bought me wine. It was quite an area. I was sitting way up high in a restaurant and down below me was the surf coming in and hundreds of people on the beach in various amounts of dress. And I was about the only one that, that everybody could speak English, but I was the only one that had a Canadian accent. Everybody else was mostly European. There I am at the turtle place. It was so cool picking them up. They're flapping at you and everything, but it, it was awesome seeing them. And there was a lot of young ones in the tank. That's a hawkbill turtle. That was another part of the cultural tour. So I did go to the fish market. Like I said, the, um, the village, Zanzibari village. Oh yes, this is a nice little story. Um, it was a very mysterious little bug in the room. So when I woke up in the morning, you can see on the left-hand side of my face, how swollen it was. My eye was practically shut. Um, so when I went downstairs and reported it, um, the company that um, Quest had, they came immediately, brought a doctor to me, had a nurse check in with me every day. The maids completely cleaned my room from top to bottom. They hung new curtains. They fixed a latch on my door just in case something got in that way. It was incredible how well I was looked after. But I'll tell you that evening, I didn't feel very good. So I was having an ice pack on my face and calamine lotion and um, wet cloths on my legs. So I was quite the picture, I'll tell you. This was when I had gone to the village. Cute little kids and just an example of their homes. A lot of the um, areas that wanted to be cordoned off and part of their homes was all woven uh, palm. So the weaving was incredible. And this, this woman actually took me into her home. Bibi. This is the woman over here in the middle. Um, there was a wedding going on that day. So it was all the communal cooking going on and BB means um, grandmother. I do have a picture inside that she was so happy and so lovely. And you can see their homes have the weaving, which um, is most of the doorways. It's adobe um, also, and, um, and some of stone. Most of, the, most of them are Muslim also. There is some Christian, but most of Zanzibar is Muslim. And there's some traditional religions also. This is just a short little video. It just kind of shows you what we were doing. Yeah, everything around the homes, everything was so clean, but this was the refuse <laughs> from when it was cleaned up and it was just all sitting in the bush all around them.
but the pathways were mostly clean. Just an example of the streets that we were driving in. I'll let you read that for a minute. I hope it comes up enough that, uh, that you can read it. It was very interesting and very sobering. I um, did not go to Stone Town. That is the town on the um, Western side. And it is one of the biggest places and it is where most of the slave markets were, but I didn't go there. These steps were incredible. They looked so easy. I had sandals on, but I'll tell you, I was clinging on to the handrails. And those handrails are only there for tourists. Um, just from all the thousands of feet of people being sent down into these caves, um, the steps were all facing down. They weren't level. So you, I had to hang on to the handrails. It was quite treacherous. You can see there how they're sort of tipped forward and down into the cavern. Once you were down in there, it was just a big cavern. There was tunnels leading off um, from it and there would be maybe, the, the cabin would maybe, cavern, sorry, was maybe 20 by 20 and there would probably be at least 80 people crammed in there. And then they were forced to go through the tunnels because even in slave trading times, there was issues of it um, trying to be stopped. And this cave in particular was used a, um, a fair bit of time after the um, slave trade was abolished. A little fresh water well, which was constant. And this, <clears throat> when I saw this, I didn't realize what it was. It just looked like a hole in the rock to me. But this is the, ent or the end of one of the tunnels and people were forced through that hole. And believe me, I would have been squished royally trying to get in and out of that hole. So it was very, very sobering to think what these poor people were going through. And it was probably at least a hundred yards of tunnel under that. And this was right up on the shore. So there'd be ships waiting for them. Now we're getting into the fish market. I just wanted to take pictures to show um, what vegetables and stuff were there. It was very, very busy. It was very exciting actually. And the smells were awesome. This is a short picture. It just kind of gives you an idea of what I uh, they are busy as well, black men. They are working hard. As you can tell, most of the fishermen are probably men, but that woman that was doing the scaling, she is the only female in the whole fish market that has her own business. Um, women aren't usually fishermen or have the fish trade, but this woman certainly did and she was very well respected. So you can see there's kind of green like fish there. There's sort of gar like fish. Um, and then the, the reddish colored one is more like a snapper. And actually I've eaten that and it did taste like snapper. Yeah, the gutter system, that was incredible. <laughs> everything went into the gutter, and I mean everything. This is the short little video because it was so funny. This woman was screaming at first, like yelling, and I couldn't figure out what the heck she was yelling about, but you'll be able to see. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite funny.
this is just a short little clip. It's only a few seconds long. It's just kind of to show you the pictures of the beach. Crack line. <laughs> so everybody, everybody's busy here. Yeah. Uh, everybody's busy. Yeah, it's very busy. Oh, this was at the wildlife refuge that I went to. It was mostly turtles that they were um, looking after, but they did have examples of some of the animals. So a bush baby and some duku, which are teeny tiny little things. They're really not much bigger than um, a very small Springer Spaniel, maybe. monitor lizard and a hermit crab. There was all sorts of things there. This is a bit long. It's a bit tedious, but it was fascinating to see this man working. He was sitting right along the main highway. And um, I'll let you see, there's a couple of videos here. Um, his child is about eight years old in the back working the bellows. And this man is in his very early thirties. Um, he's a blacksmith. And the video will sh tell you about the rest. So this is how they make it, huh? Here they can make a nails, like this one here. They can make a knife. They can make something like this. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So all of these. This one. Right? Now he's making a knife. Knife, yeah. 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 And this. So first they have to cut a piece of iron, mm -hmm. like this. Yep. And after cutting them, they make a fire there, they use a charcoal, and then for compression. Mm -hmm. They do this for compression. Yep. And then and after... That keeps the fire hot. Yeah, 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 yeah. And after getting hot, it looks red, take them out so that they knock them yep. to make that they want to make it. Right. So some, they can make a knife, they can make a nails, they can make a, something like this mm -hmm. and other things. Mm -hmm. But always, this we use them for making Dao building. Oh, the dowel. Yeah, oh, the okay. dowel. Use that. This kind of nails. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they use these nails. So this they make uh, traditionally. So people have they don't have to go and buy the nails from dowel making. So they have to come with these guys. You can see. This, this is how they. Do. This is how they. Do. So he's going to make a nail like this, mm -hmm. so that you can see later until okay. that's a starting point, and after that you can see how they make it yep. until they, they put the head. Right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you're tired. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's very interesting. And after that, I just add it. Mm -hmm. So those nail bolts, we don't have to buy in the shop. So mm -hmm. a lot of people like this, they just make and then they sell it to those people who make uh, bolts. Okay. Yeah. Everything is done by hand. Mm -hmm. yeah, everything is done by hand. So in order to make this, they have to they have to get a piece of nail. They make sure that they have it. Fire, compression. Yeah. Hammer. Yep. Yeah, yeah, a knife like that to cut it. So now they, they are going to cut it. So that one is for cutting. Mm -hmm. So they cut it, they just keep, and then they put the head. You can see. And so this is the next part of it. Um, it's just him pounding, making the head of the nail.
So that young man um, had been doing that since he was about 12. Um, he was a, considered a very accomplished blacksmith. Um, his child that was about eight, that was the one that was using the bellows and helping him pound. Um, he did go to school, but his lot in life would be to take over his father's business when he was old enough. So that was, it was pretty sobering to think like that, um, but that's their life and they're very happy with that life. They don't want to change it. And he was a very proud man and was very eloquent in the way he was speaking with my guide. I couldn't understand it, obviously. They were speaking mostly Swahili. So then we moved on to the beaches and um, just pictures, <laughs> shells absolutely everywhere. Um, oh yeah, and about the, the blacksmith, he was extremely happy because this, I moved on to the Dows, which was only a few miles from him. He had gotten a contract to make a thousand nails for the shipbuilding. So he was going to be in money, he said. And this, oh man, if I had room in my suitcase for all these shells, it would have been great. There were shells there. Some of them were big enough that I could make a bird bath out of, they were about three feet across and they were everywhere. Just a picture of the beach and the fishing boats. Their nets were mostly blue. That was a bit surprising to me that pretty much everything was blue. So I'll let you see that. The next few slides are for the woodworkers in the group. And the smell of the wood was fantastic. Here we are uh, thinking mahogany is the be all and the end all because we use it for furniture and it, we pay big bucks for it. But they're making all their ships out of mahogany or mango. And the color of it was beautiful and the smell was gorgeous. This is just a, a little video is just showing you and just notice the tools that are there a lot of craftsmanship yeah 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 goes into that and always at the front and at the back at the front at the back in order to get a shape mm -hmm. like this so normally they burn, the wood are burning so he was saying that the wood is banned. This is quick thing, all the wood is banned. The coconut or firewood, mm -hmm. and they put them there, and then they just. Yeah, 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 yeah. They put, uh, they put the stick, and then they put the coconut palm leaves around here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then they they bend. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They use a stick to bend it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the wood bend. Yeah. So the mahogany has enough li um, fluid in it or liquid yeah, yeah, yeah. in it yeah, to have, yeah. allow it yeah, to yeah, bend. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. They have, yeah, they have enough. Okay. So then they um, they don't use steam like we would have to with some of the hardwoods that we have. Their wood actually had enough um, sap and stuff in it that they could bend it like that and they would hold it like that and bind it with coconut twine. And that's how they kept the shape. This is a beautiful old boat and it's made of mango and that is one tree. So it's kind of like the dugout canoes, but it was a fishing vessel. Another one being built there. This, <laughs> I took this video because I was just astounded at this man, their skill um, with the tools and stuff that they had. They were very precise 
and extremely sharp, but you know, they were fairly, um, fairly unsophisticated tools in our way of thinking. Um, anyways, I'll, I'll just show you, oh, sorry. I'll just show you what he was doing with this. So this is how he makes careful. He's got a very sharp uh, Yeah. Uh, and a very close foot. Um, yeah, so back at the shipyard too, when they were, I asked them about measuring tools and all they used was string. They did not have measuring tapes and all that sort of thing. It was mostly by eye and they used string. And the string, um, they used kind of like how we would a chalk line and a plumb line, but everything was blue. And he scribed it all with blue ink also all the way along the edge of the piece of mahogany. And then they used the ads to um, knock out the pieces. And it was quite a long process, but I was astounded at how skilled they were. And this was kind of as I was coming out of the area where they were um, making the ships. Um, these buildings, you saw a lot of these buildings, none of their buildings, the local buildings anyways, were not very high. Um, they were mostly about this height. Uh, you can see in the background, some is stone. A lot of it is um, uh, with masonry in between. And it might take them up to 10 years in order to build one of these buildings and get a roof on it because everything is so, so expensive. Um, it might take them 10 years to have enough money to be able to finish some of these buildings. It was astounding. There was one young woman that was serving me lunch and she talked to me at length and I saw her a couple of days in a row and she remembers your name and, and uh, you know, asked questions about us as much as I was asking her questions. And she was very proud of herself that she had been living on her own since she was 14. She had two children. She was about, I would say maybe about 18 or 19. And she was building her own home. She had no partner. And it had, she had already saved money over six years and all she had was walls. So it sure makes you think it's bad enough that we're paying a million dollars for teeny little war houses and stuff, but uh, just put the shoe on the other foot when you're there. Now, unfortunately, we're coming to the end here. This was my last look. I went down to have a look at the Indian Ocean um, just before I was getting ready to leave. <clears throat> and that shows you there about the public beach and the private beach. Um, it also shows you with low tide. And when I walked in the ocean, it was so hot. I was astounded. It was like walking into a bathtub that was, that was quite warm water. I had to go out. I know you guys are laughing because you know I'm not very tall, but I had to go out to my chin in order to get water that was cool. Um, everything else was quite hot. That was just that nice heron that I saw just as I was leaving. And this was kind of the last look at my building where I was. It was all beautifully manicured. Um, the beach guys, you didn't dare get your own towel. You didn't move a chair or anything. They came and did it for you. And they actually frowned at you if you tried to do it yourself. So it was their job and that was what you were expected to do. Oh, this is a little, a little video that 
I thought was quite funny. You guys might not, but I thought it was. Uh, a lot of the times when we came down for dinner, um, this was all the big lounge area and tables were all set up. And then across the pool was where most of our dinners were. They had bridges built across the pool. You walked across the bridges and went over and got your food. If you look in the background there, you can see some of the um, tables that are set up. But that was mostly how our food was given to us um, in, at dinner. And we had nightly shows. Um, a lot of it was Maasai um, doing their singing and the dancing and that sort of thing. But there was lots of other things too. But um, yeah, once I turn this on, you'll hear what's happening. Here I am at the airport. Um, considering <laughs> what we know as airports, this was a very busy, very um, posh airport. And you can see a lot of uh, the tourists that are there from all different nationalities. The couple that's sitting there, the lady with her arms in the front there, they were from Germany. Um, the people behind were from Taiwan, I believe. And like I said, when I was there, I was really the only one that had this type of accent. Everyone else um, was mostly European and in Zanzibar is a huge Mecca for tourists. And when you talk to the people about Zanzibar, they are a little upset that the tourists come for the beaches and for the food and to be entertained, even though that's what we expect on a vacation. But they didn't feel that, that as tourists that we did um, looking into their culture, looking into their food, looking into their agriculture, you know, that sort of thing. So it was very interesting talking to some of them. And <laughs> like I said, this was the picture of the last day. And this was a picture of what I was coming home to. If you remember, <laughs> you guys got the most horrific storm. I think it was the 28th of February. Everything, everything was shut down. <laughs> My kids were all texting me and phoning me and sending me pictures. This is what I was coming home to. So I came home on March the 9th. Um, the world was shut down March 13th. Um, Italy at the time when I was coming back, I flew from Zanzibar to uh, Ethiopia, Addis Ababa. Um, and the Ethiopian airport, you could not get off the plane unless you washed your hands. When you walked in, you weren't allowed in the building unless you wash your hands. They made you separate at least six feet between people as you entered the building. You were not allowed to go get your baggage um, more than one person at a time. You were forced to sit in distancing. And every time you moved from one spot to another, you had to wash your hands. By the time I got back to Toronto, which was 26 hours, I believe later, um, with the time change and everything, I got home to Toronto. It was business as usual, even though half the world was shut down with COVID. Like I said, Italy was shut down the day I was leaving. And um, we were treated just as normal, shoved together like a herd of cattle and going through. So that's what it was like when, uh, when I got home. And that's pretty much the end of my slides. So I will stop sharing. 
And there's a couple things that I'll show you. Um, one of the packages, I don't know if you can see that. Maybe you can't. There, maybe. Anyways, this is a mix. I'll just read what's here. It's the Zanzibar Palau Masala. So Palau is a, a rice dish. I'll kind of show you what it looks like. This is a cookbook my daughter got me for Christmas and it's, it's all uh, African, East African cooking, cooking wherever I was. So it's called Zanzibar Palau. But what it is is um, rice, but it gives you the instructions here. And it says, this mixture is of cinnamon, cumin, cardamom, ginger, black pepper, and cloves. And how to use, fly onion and garlic until become brown and the add with palau masala for five minutes. The put water and potatoes boil together with rice up to become dry. Put in oven for three minutes, you palau is ready. And it was from um, Kaisabar is the spice farm that I was at. So I did bring lots of things like that. I brought all kinds of shells home. I brought a little bit of Tanzanian money home and this, I hope you can see that a bit. This was one of the spice packages that I brought home from my kids. And in this spice package, the bottom is cloves, and then there's cardamom, cumin, chili, and chili is spelled C-H-I-L-L-Y, uh, sesame seeds. Oh, that was the one thing I didn't show you was the sesame plant. That was quite interesting. It's kind of like rice. Um, red curry, yellow curry, cinnamon and lemongrass. So that's the kind of things that I brought home, but I brought home bags of pepper and um, cloves and huge amounts of cinnamon, all that sort of thing. So that's pretty much it for me. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope everyone got to see everything. Um, I'll just, uh, John sending me good presentation, it was neat to see the spices in their original form. I'll just go to the questions. Um, was the cave cool? Marsha's asking me, Marsha Courtney. And it was, but not as cool as what you would think. It was underground about um, 12 feet down in the tunnels. I didn't want to go in them too much because there was a lot of bats in the cave and I was a little nervous about going down with all the bats. Um, and they, it was black, totally black in there. And these poor people, as they were being shoved into these tunnels and told to keep going, they couldn't see a thing. There was no light whatsoever. So the caves were cool, but not, not as cool as some of the caves that I've been in. It's, it is extremely hot country and everything was wet. Nothing was dry. Um, when they stopped, to have someone show you their trade or their skill. Did you pay? Oh yes, that's part of my story that I didn't tell you. When I was in the village, I was a stupid tourist, really. And this is a warning to anyone who's, who travels to different countries and stuff. I asked my guide, was it okay if I gave some money? I wanted to give them $20 US and I knew that was a huge amount of money for them. He said, yes, I could certainly give them money. And he told me the woman to give it to. <clears throat> the woman that he wanted me to give it to <laughs> was a young woman, the one in the picture that I showed you that was holding the baby. I gave it to her and he was interpreting for me saying that I was giving it for the wedding and um, that it would provide hopefully some food and whatever they needed that hopefully I could buy for them. And that I was so appreciative that they were so generous in opening their homes and allowing me to go in. I felt very privileged in order to do that. It would be like somebody from a different country coming to your door and knocking on your door and saying, I want to come in and see everything. You know, how would we feel about that? Anyways, that was my stupid tourist mistake. I caused a huge argument between these women 
We were still arguing when I left. I was almost in tears. Then I spoke to a friend of mine um, who lived in the Congo. And he laughed at me and he said, of course, that's what most tourists think is that to give somebody money. And he said, that's the stupidest thing that you can do. The best thing to do for any um, something that you want to show gratitude is go to the nearest fruit stand, buy it out, buy everything that, that there is in that, take it back to the village, give them food. Um, you're helping not only the village, then you're also helping the person that has the fruit stand. So that was my comeuppance for that. Um, did you have any results at customs? Oh, did you have any issues at customs bringing back spices? No, <laughs> shocking, I didn't. I brought back spices, I brought back jewelry, I brought back, well, I showed you in my other presentation about the tanzanite that I brought back. I brought back shells, all uh, material, all kinds of things. Um, and no, they didn't say anything to me at all. I claimed it all on my customs form, but no, they didn't even look at it and everything was perfectly fine. So I did bring home, I squished more spices into my suitcase than you could possibly imagine. Um, this one's not a comment. Beautiful people and great and informative photos and comments. Thank you. Uh, on a totally different matter, I have a copy of Adam Schultz's book, Whisper in the Night Wind, which I can pass along to anyone interest, interested. And this is from Eileen Connor. So that's good. The other thing I want to do before all of you leave is I want to be able to give you a door prize. So I picked 55. So whoever 55 is. Yes, Pam, it was uh, Shauna McIver is the lucky winner. Oh, cool. I know Shauna. Okay. So that's cool. Excellent. So she gets the door prize. So if, if Shauna can uh, give me a call, I think she actually has my number. Or um, if you want to uh, get her information, then I can send that out to her. And uh, Pam, so and on, think, behalf of the, on behalf of all of our viewers and uh, everyone watching at home, I, I want to thank you for such a wonderful presentation. Um, I think John had a comment in the chat and the same for me, a, a lot of the spices I, I just take for granted in, in, in my cupboard and I really had no idea what they look like growing live. Uh, I vaguely yeah. remember seeing pepper before most of those, I have no idea. And you've, you've uh, doubled my resolve to attempt to grow ginger again. Uh, or at least get, get try and get some ginger growing. I love ginger and the idea that it could be stronger, whether we have the heat to, to get it uh, like you taste it is probably not the case, but it's worth a go. Um, and so the workers, I was kind of amazed at the blacksmith and the, and the, uh, the fellow making the boat. Uh, I mean, sitting on the ground, bare feet, swinging uh, hammers and with a fire close by and ashes, they must have a different uh, health and safety more than we do workplace health and safety yeah. and also in yeah, the middle of sure. winter i mean we're it's freezing cold out here you had an excellent comparison at the end um and just the the heat everything it looked so hot there and warm you've made me appreciate our february yeah yes for sure so, for sure i thank you believe again. how hot it was <laughs> so wonderful Good. talk as always thank you so much thank you Thank you very much. Good night, everyone.